Hello everyone, uh, my name is Kevin and I'm here with Novedge Marketing Strategist Aurora Menegello. Aurora. Hi everybody, thank you Kevin for having me on the show again and happy 10th anniversary at Novedge. Welcome you all to our latest Novedge webinar series episode. Um, just a heads up, we do have we are celebrating our 10th anniversary, and uh, I think uh, for close to a decade now, right? Or maybe o a little bit over? Yeah, well, uh, we're celebrating online, of course, and all our social media, but we're also celebrating next week in San Francisco. So if you're in San Francisco on April 11th, you can check all the details on our Facebook um, event page. On April 11th, we're going to have an open house for all our customers and fans here in San Francisco. So come by our office and say hello and meet the team. That's right, guys. So if you Chat with us, have a drink, uh, uh, we're doing a little spritzer, then uh, yeah, feel free to come on by and uh, yeah, you can get to meet us and the team here at Novinch. So some of you are may, may already know this, but, uh, but last month the team at Bluebeam released uh, Review 11, which is their newest version to date. Uh, for those who are curious about the new changes, uh, today's episode 68 will explore in depth what's in out and improved in the brand new Revu 11. Uh, to do so, we've partnered up with Bluebeam's own East Coast Regional Product Manager, James Chambers, who will be on deck to present and answer your questions. Uh, today's webinar presentation will be about 40 minutes long, and afterwards we'll have a brief live Q&A session where James and a member of his team will field questions from those attending. James, uh, if you'd like to say hi to everybody here. I would love to. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us, and uh, congratulations to Novich for celebrating 10 fantastic years. Thank you. Awesome. Looking forward to another 20. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So if you don't know who James is, uh, James, uh, he earned a Bachelor of Arts in 3D Design with Applied Engineering from uh, Sheffield Halam University, uh, and that's in the UK. So if you guys can't tell already, James is from the United Kingdom. Uh, he is currently responsible for managing, developing, and presenting Bluebeam product demonstrations as well as training events for clients and audiences. Uh, prior to his work at Bluebeam, James was a production technology engineer at Van S. Hagen Brislin. And I apologize if I pronounced that correct, incorrectly. Uh, that was, was awesome. Close. Uh, awesome. 80%. I'm aiming for 80%. Um, in addition to that, he's also worked as a software support engineer at Adria Systems. Um, so if you guys would like to, uh, we have Bert fortunate to have James volunteer his time to answer your Bluebeam related questions and if you may please give him a figurative uh, round of applause clap clap so before we get going with the presentation here's an overview of what we do at Novedge uh, the Novedge webinar series is brought to you in part by Novedge.com as one of the largest online design software stores, uh, we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's needs. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Bluebeam Review 11, it is available worldwide from us at Noveg as a digital delivery with zero sales tax. Give us a call and feel free to contact our sales representative, Bob Bayer at bob at noveg.com. Aurora? And as I mentioned before, uh, we are on Facebook. We post a lot of content, and we'd love to hear from you. So like us on Facebook and Novedge. And also every uh, week, we post two interviews with an artist or an innovator in the field on our blog. So check it out if you haven't yet, blognovedge.com. And in our next upcoming webinar, webinar number 69, we're going to take a look at our Atlantis Studio 4.1. And um, what we're going to focus on is using shaders in Atlantis, covering different types of shaders, the shaders inspector, the catalog, media collection, postcards, and custom shaders creation. So, also, by the way, uh, today's webinar is recorded, so if you want to rewatch episode 68 with James Chambers uh, talking about Bluebeam Review 11 in its entirety, as always, you can find it on our NoVeg webinar series channel through Vimeo and YouTube. Uh, with that said, James, um, are you ready? I am ready, yes. I understand that you're using a microphone now, right? I am, yeah. How's the clarity? Everybody hear me okay? It sounds good. 80%. 80%. 80%. <laughs> Cool. All right, so I'm going to officially switch over to you right about now. Take it away. All right, sounds good. 
I will show my screen. And uh, all right, well, again, thank you everybody for uh, for coming here. And um, just to get started, uh, I'm not sure if how many of the audience is uh, familiar with Bluebeam, but I uh, just wanted to share a little bit about Bluebeam. Um, we are, as a company, we are um, continue to play a central role in the AEC industry, and we focus primarily on the design, uh, construction industry, with smart, simple solutions that facilitate digital workflow really for anything, for design review, bid estimation, RFI, field inspection, uh, site management, all the way through to close out. Uh, basically leveraging something as universal as the PDF format to allow this uh, efficient workflow. Um, every year, uh, Bluebeam delivers uh, a new, excuse me, um, delivers a, a new way um, with the breakthrough technology to enable you to work better without compromise. Uh, we believe the big ideas don't have to be complicated, and with Review 11, uh, we're really pushing the limits of project communication, uh, basically to let people work smarter versus harder. Um, so with Review 11, basically anything is possible. Um, in each year, with every new release, we typically have a theme, um, and this year the theme is document organization and communication. So really basically essentially helping you uh, to get even more organized and enhance your digital workload process. So there's some very cool new tools in uh, Review 11 for those of you that haven't seen. Um, and primarily here we've got uh, some of the ones that I'm really going to be showing you because I think these will really help illustrate that, uh, that collaborative, uh, efficient workflow. Um, the format Painter lets you standardize the appearance of markup tools with one fell swoop. And um, automated bookmarks is, uh, is going to be a game changer. This is going to allow you to create bookmarks from page labels and page labels from bookmarks. Uh, uh, anybody working in hundreds of documents will really appreciate this. Um, SETS gives you the ability to view and access an unlimited number of files and navigate them uh, as if they were a single document and a single tab. Um, we've had visual, uh, visual search before, but in 11, the enhancements are absolutely fantastic. Um, you can find a symbol or an element regardless of its uh, rotation, its size, its color, any line interferences. Um, it's a truly powerful tool now for getting visual search results uh, that can be used for really for anything. Um, the formula editor, for those that have used the markup list down below, we now actually have a really nice, uh, efficient, uh, intuitive custom formulas that create uh, calculations for things like uh, costs and materials. Uh, we have Studio Offline mode, enabling you to utilize Studio's web-based collaboration tool, both on and offline, for those that are on the job site versus back in the office. Um, and then some uh, some amazing 3D enhancements, such as not limited to uh, converting IFC files. So we now have complete IFC interface with uh, the PDS and isolating regions. So that in conjunction with what is Review's core functionality, and again, sorry for those of you that are Review lovers and users, but the intuitive interface, uh, really customizable, allows you to easily access your markup tools and then even deploy those and share those with uh, other people or across your organization for consistency. Um, with consistency comes the industry standard markups. Uh, we really are that easy to place, create, and alter and edit markups. Uh, and I'll certainly show you that. Then we have the tool chest, which is a place to create and store all those custom markups for really easy reuse. Um, and then, of course, the markup list. Everything is about accountability, and the markup list is going to give you a phenomenal way to track that and search and filter those. So in today's agenda, I really want to talk a little bit about markup tracking, um, talk about the design review collaboration process, um, talk about some pre-construction project setups. So again, we're really thinking about PDF documents in the entirety of our project workflow. So document organization, management control, uh, showing you how to do quantity takeoffs and estimations right through the PDF file. And then we'll get into tracking changes, uh, communicating in the field, and uh, how to simply close that whole, whole deal out. So. So with that being said, let's go ahead and see Bluebeam in action. And um, here we have, uh, I'm going to hit escape. And uh, as, you, as some of you are aware, this is the interface that we're in. It's a smart, intuitive interface. Um, I have a control panel, control bar up here for, uh, this is in 10 and 11 now. You'll notice as I click on any of the applicable command bars, uh, all of those available options will be available right here for me to see, as well as some static ones that I want to use for file manipulation and control. Um, now we have a, a way and a method of uh, changing and standardizing this profile, uh, this interface, and that's with a profile. 
So under view, I'm going to click on this uh, this little fella here with uh, not a lot of hair and a bow tie. This is our profile guy. Right now, I'm in a simple profile. I'm simply going to uh, move that up. We have some pre-canned uh, or standard templates, uh, profiles, sorry, that come with that, uh, with review. Um, and I have some here that I've created myself. But I'm going to switch to my AEC profile. It will click and change the interface. It will add some new toolbars that I have access to. Um, and then let's, uh, let's go ahead and start um, accessing some files. We have some additional information in tabs that we keep on either side of the application. Uh, and those can be accessed by this tab access down here. So I'm going to grab my file access. And um, this is really good for accessibility. I, I can open any of the, the, the tabs here. So um, I can see basically a number of different information. I can see all my recent files, so files that I've recently seen uh, and opened. And with one mouse click, I can reopen those very quickly, very efficiently. Um, I have the ability to store and pin those. So if these are files that I constantly want to use, I can simply right click and pin them and have direct, easy access right back to them and their network location. So uh, if I were to click on uh, this, this folder here, it will jump me straight to the, the folder location on my network drive and allow me access to all of the other relevant files that I want. So a great way to track those. Um, I'm going to open up, uh, actually while I was in there, let's open up a uh, uh, structural steel specification as well, just so we've got some different files here. Um, now, let's say um, I wanted to show and indicate some drawings or some changes that might have happened between two drawings. Uh, I have the ability to uh, easily do that within Bluebeam uh, by essentially using split screens. So I'm going to maximize the view, and down here I have the ability to split my screen horizontally and vertically uh, up to 16 different times. Um, so again, in this case, I've got a looks like a revision A and, a, and then the original drawing here. If I were to very easily and very quickly zoom in or scroll into one location, hopefully you'll notice that the corresponding windows will zoom and jump to the exact same location. Uh, and zooming and panning, incidentally, should be a hard job, really easy. Uh, use my middle mouse wheel to zoom. Uh, use the same one to simply scroll or pan around. So I can have these working in a synchronized way, or I can unsynchronize them and uh, look independently. Um, I can even open multiple different drawings. So if I wanted to have a more specification open here to review and have my drawing open at the same time, very easy for me to do so. So let's talk a little bit about those industry standard markups. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and close these and unsplit these windows, go back to my, my main drawing here. and. Um, so I've opened my uh, my recent version. Let's talk about marking this up. Let's say I need some clarification on this curtain wall. Uh, I'm going to zoom into this location up here, and I'm going to want to cloud an area. So I'm going to add a cloud or a column to I'll grab my cloud tool over here and uh, basically drag this over here. I'm going to add a second cloud over here, um, and let's say I want to very quickly change the properties of this. Um, if you can use Word and Excel, you can really use this. I have the ability to add a fill color here, so we'll add a teal. I can add a borderline of blue. I can even change the fill opacity, so should I want to see underlying content, very easy for me to do so. Um, now, with the format painter, uh, I can go ahead and so let's add a few more mockups here. I'm going to add another cloud area over here. Um, I'm going to uh, add, an, uh, add an image as well. Let me go ahead and uh, insert an image very quickly by using my image tool. I'll grab the curtain wall. I've got a, an image of a mummy. I'm just going to drop and drag this on here very quickly, very easily. Um, now, I have a couple of extra clouds here, and I might have taken the time, the trouble to set up uh, this color here to delineate a certain workflow, a certain discipline. And uh, with a new uh, format painter, uh, I can come in here choose my, my source, if you want to call it that, and then by hitting Format Painter, simply click on my destinations and uh, give them the exact same format, same color, the same look and feel. And this can be applied to any mockup, regardless of whether it's a cloud or a pull-out tool or whatever it happens to be. But a very quick way for me to do that. Um, I also have the ability in Review 11 to take the clouding to a, a greater experience. Let's say I want to look at this administrative building here, this administrative room 128. I'm going to drag a cloud over the room, and I want to talk about, well, I actually want to talk about the, the drywall that I have in here. So I'm going to add a, a second cloud on the inside of that 
and then I'm going to right click on that and I uh, go to my properties panel and I'm going to select invert to make that an inverted cloud to really sort of draw your attention to the interior section of that wall um, uh, as opposed to the outer wall. Um, another quick uh, m a change here has been the markup capability. So I'll grab my call out tool, very nice efficient tool here. I can come in here and uh, write a number or a text box in here. So in this case, I'll just say, um, maybe I'll just put a letter A to distinguish a detail here. I can right click and automatically resize that text box. Um, I can also, in my properties panel, uh, give this um, a look and feel. So instead of it being a rectangle, I could go ahead and make it a circle uh, or, uh, or even a triangle. Um, the nice thing as well is if I move, you'll notice that the leader lines will now jump to the new location uh, and follow me where I'm going. So uh, again, some very uh, more efficient, more AutoCAD type workflow there from a, from a studio software. Um, so let's say I've got a, a bunch of markups here and I might want to actually, um, I might want to group them all together. So I can use a, a lasso tool or I could do control A on my keyboard and grab all of these and I want to give them all an association because right now these are all my um, architectural comments. So I'll go ahead and give them all the same name and look and feel um, so that they all have the same association. And um, let's go back and talk a little bit about that tool chest that we have hidden over here on the left hand side. Uh, again, I could open up the tab or use my tab access and go down to tool chest. And, um, here you'll see that uh, in the tool chest, uh, again, a great way to uh, store everything and allow me to reuse it. So should I want to bring that same uh, architectural callout to a different area of the drawing, um, I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I simply drag it from its previous location and bring it back out uh, and place it right on the drawing to indicate a new area. So, um, and you can see that what we've done by this is uh, I've taken out our recent tools, but I also have the ability to add it to some uh, existing tool sets that I've created. So here I've created a, an architectural, mechanical, and a plumbing tool set uh, by simply giving some color and some delineation. So now I have a tool set that uh, I can distribute to team members and have them mark up the drawing in the same way. So we've placed some, uh, some comments and markups onto this drawing. Uh, let's go ahead and pull up this markup list down below and show you how we've actually managed to track every comment and annotation that's been placed on this PDF drawing through the review process. Uh, in the AC realm, it, it's typical for an ongoing need for accountability on the project and the ability to verify who said what. And the markup list uh, automatically tracks that by subject date or for whatever metadata you have associated, uh, thereby eliminating the need to keep separate lists of spreadsheets. So as I hover over each of these, you'll notice that it actually will highlight those on the drawing above. Uh, there's a direct correlation between the mockup and the uh, and the markups list down below. Uh, vice versa, if I were to jump onto a, a mockup, you'll see that it, it highlights in the drawing list down below. So I can leverage this markup list to uh, merge comments from several copies uh, of the drawing into one sort of same master drawing. So for instance, let's say I've sent this drawing off to three different uh, disciplines um, and they've all individually added their comments. Um, I can now import those into a central location using the import comment field. I can jump out, uh, grab my import comments, I'll grab my electrical, my mechanical, my plumbing, and I'll simply open those and bring those back into uh, this drawing. So you'll notice that this is now populated with additional information here. So I can actually, now I've got a lot of information on this drawing, I, I can actually use much like Excel, I can use filtering uh, to sort out and find the information I want. So if I were to turn on filter and in my drop down um, I will go to um, what am I going to look for? Let's look for uh, my mechanical in this case. Um, and you'll see now that it's filtered and sorted out just those mechanical comments. It's grayed out all the miscellaneous or extraneous comments allow me to just to focus on those. Uh, and now in this case I can actually access or assign responsibilities. Uh, so in this case let's say this is H. Calloway, uh, this is Robert, uh, this is already, in fact, most of these are now going to be H. Callaway, so I could grab multiple and 
just double click and uh, sorry, make this H Callaway. Uh, I can then further filter by responsibility by just uh, H Callaway to go ahead and create, say, a task list uh, for H Callaway by using filtering. Um, I can then very easily summarize this information to, again, create that task list. I'm going to open up my thumbnails tab here just to show that uh, this is a single page document currently. And I'll go to summary. I could instantly kick this information straight out to Excel or XML, but in this case I'll make a PDF summary. Um, I'll call this one task list uh, H Callaway. And uh, I'll go ahead and hit, uh, hit OK. What this is going to do is create a summarized PDF task list here uh, or report with all the mechanical sub-consultant information here assigned to H. Callaway, the information that's on here as well as a miniature preview of the drawing itself or the market itself. But if I were to click on that, it will hyperlink me back to the original document and show me in context uh, what those questions are and where they were asked. So great, great workflow there, really nice and helpful. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, let me just shut these down a little bit. Shut this. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, let's talk a little bit about um, collaboration uh, and uh, one step further. In today's fast-paced market, there's, there's often a need to make key decisions uh, and advance projects in real time. Uh, so that workflow can commence quickly. Uh, typically, the design teams are not centrally located, but they're split across multiple offices, time zones. Uh, so going through the process of having one person place their comments and then one copy another person reviewing it uh, is somewhat painful. Um, but to that end, what we've done is we've come up with uh, Studio. And by leveraging our cloud-based collaboration tool, Studio, uh, you can access real-time, up-to-date information from anywhere, any device, be that a, a laptop or a desktop or an iPad, um, and have easy communication for everybody with no downtime. So uh, in Studio, you can host up, uh, you can host PDF documents uh, or several documents uh, into a session and invite a number of project participants who will all be able to simultaneously view and mock up as well as place, uh, place their mockups. Um, if attendees are joining the session using the free viewer, uh, they will still have access to all the mockup tools during that session. Uh, so again, a great, a big key point there. You don't need to have Blooming to do this. Um, you can use the, uh, the free viewer while attending a studio session. So. so let's jump in there and show you what this would look like. I'm going to jump into studio and um, let's go ahead and join, uh, open a session that I had previously here. And um, here you can see, um, in this case, let's say I was the architect and I have a design team spread across a number of locations internationally, maybe uh, New York, uh, LA, et cetera, the engineering team. Um, and I've sent them or I've uploaded and invited them to this studio session. Um, and here you can see, I can see very quickly who is in the session. So myself, I have a coworker here, Allison. Uh, another coworker has been into the session adding comments. and. Um, I can actually control what everybody can do. Uh, so if I were to go up to the permissions here, I can see that I have total control over the, the attendees. I can add them. I can uh, interact straight with Outlook to set up uh, uh, groups there. And then I can control the permissions of what I want these people to be able to do. Do I want them to save, print, mark up, add documents, et cetera. So you as the host have complete control over the ability of what people can do in and out of these studio sessions. So if I were to uh, come through here, I can take a look at any of the previous comments that have been added by people. Uh, I can even follow people. So if right now I'm uh, working with Allison, and Allison is my, uh, my architect out in LA, I can actually hit follow. And um, I can now actually follow where she is. And instead of having that uh, erroneous conversation of, oh, here I am. I'm over in this room over here. No, look at the map. It's over there. It's over there. It's on that plan. I can very quickly follow Allison and get a visual idea of exactly where she is while we're talking about uh, this document. I'll go ahead and stop following her because she's been walking around enough there. And um, again, we have the ability to completely track uh, and record all of those, um, all of those uh, comments that have been placed while I've been in and out of this session. We track them in a, a record document here, uh, as well as the markup list down below. 
Um, let me bring that up if I can. And you'll see that the same information is being tracked down in the markup list, so I have the ability to, again, create those summary reports should I want to. Um, but in this case, uh, the studio itself, the session itself, gives me a fantastic uh, way of being able to uh, take track and generate a report. Um, one thing to incidentally add as well, I can actually use, if I were to uh, use my filter and go back to mechanical, uh, I could come in here and still allow sessions. So you'll notice that even though somebody else has placed this mechanical comment on here, um, I have the ability to view it. I can't edit, change, or alter it, but I can actually add some statuses. So if I wanted to right-click and add a, an engineering custom status here to say this is pending, you'll notice that it tracks now that this, this has been changed by me. This is James Chambers, this time and this date. It's also assigned a new color to indicate a change of status, because that might be important to me for visual reference. Um, if I were to right-click again and change that status to uh, completed, you'll see that it's turned green. So again, I might have a way to further filter to see and use a check here to verify what's been done throughout this, uh, this life cycle of this project or this meeting. So at the point where this meeting might be done, I'm going to go ahead and create a, a nice report here uh, by simply um, clicking on report here. And I might say this could be, say, my 30% submission. Um, uh, whatever it might be, 30% submission, and I'll go ahead and say I want to make a PDF package of this to keep a nice archival set. I'll save it on my desktop, and Bluebeam will go ahead and generate that really nice, concise PDF package here uh, with the container of all the documents we were discussing, and then a complete collaborative report uh, with the name of the session, the date, uh, a hyperlinked association to the list of the attendees and the documents, and then a complete chronological archive as to every conversation that's happened. So again, doing your administrative work here, creating your meeting minutes, um, and all the way through uh, being able to have complete interaction here. So again, if I were to click on one of those line items, it would jump me back to the drawing and show me in context where that comment had been placed. So again, uh, making for a very efficient workflow, uh, being able to uh, leverage that. So let's talk, um, I'm going to get out of this studio session for the moment. I'll go ahead and leave that. And while I leave that, incidentally, um, I still have left the availability for people to go in there and continue to uh, place their comments as they need to. Um, so again, great, uh, great use of, uh, of uh, the workflow there. So let's go ahead and talk a little bit about document organization and management. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about automated page labeling. And for those of you in the AEC world, I would love it if we worked on a single project that had one drawing. But unfortunately, that isn't the case. There is typically multiple drawings, multiple files, multiple revisions. Um, so in that case, we've actually come up uh, with the idea and talk about markup tracking, the design review process, um, and talk about the design uh, document organization. Um, so I'm actually going to open up my thumbnails tab here. And I'm going to go and open uh, my combined set. Let's go ahead and open up uh, my combined set PDF file. And open my thumbnails tab. And you should notice that, uh, for those of you that have worked on documents, that uh, this has one of those typical naming conventions. Each sheet is called 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Uh, some sheets have come in with other information that might have been kicked out of Revit or AutoCAD, but there's no consistency to how these things are named right now. Um, but if I were to view, uh, in the past I could typically, this is a, it looks like in the bottom right-hand corner I have a sheet number here, A000. Um, in the past I would have to double-click in here and change this to be A000, and it would be very laborious to go through and rename everything with a new naming convention. Um, so we've, uh, we've tried to help everybody out here by leveraging what we call uh, create page labels. So I'll go ahead and hit this button, and uh, I can create uh, page labels by region. So I'll zoom into the lower right-hand corner of this drawing, and I'll say go and look at every single sheet or page, grab this information here, and make sure that I'm selecting all of my documents. Now if everybody looks at the thumbnail view here, when I hit OK, some magic is going to happen. And it's now going to automatically renumber every and rename every single page according to what their drawing number or sheet number is down here. So as I scroll through here, you'll see it's picked up some structural information. 
it's picked up some engineering and NEP information, but it's basically renamed all of my drawings according to the naming convention that the sheets actually have. Uh, so again, phenomenal amount of workflow there with one uh, with one mouse click. Now the next thing about what we can do with that is typically it's going to be some level of navigation. Um, so with bookmarks, there's currently zero bookmarks on this uh, document set right here. Um, and what I can actually do is leverage the same technology. I can create bookmarks. And because we've already gone through the previous step of grabbing the page labels automatically, I can say go ahead and use the page label names. Select again all of the pages, and I'll hit OK. And now Bluebeam will automatically correct, uh, create the automated bookmarks for me, allowing me to very quickly and very easily navigate to the pages that I want uh, in a bookmarked uh, fashion. So again, why, why should you have to do all the hard work? Let's leverage it and make Bluebeam do it for you. Let's talk a little bit about um, pre-construction or construction project setup process. Um, once the digital construction document has been issued uh, and sent to the builder or the contractor, uh, can now utilize uh, another group of useful tools um, and lean and easy accessible document set. So uh, at this point, we're going to extract um, each of the sheets as their own PDF file. So again, at this point, uh, this is a combined set. This is a 35-page document. This is a relatively small document, but 35-page document. And um, I can actually, let me open up the project folder that I have here to show you that this is going to be my extracted set location. There's zero, zero files in there right now. Uh, but again, I might want to work on these individually or offline or, or pull them into a studio session. So to, to extract these pages and maintain their page numbering, numbering and naming uh, is kind of critical. So in this case, I'm going to right click. I'm going to go to Extract Pages. And um, you'll notice that I can come here and say Extract as Separate Files. And I've also got a checkbox here that says uh, Use the Page Names or Label to label the files. So I'll go ahead and hit OK, and you'll notice that Bluebeam will now automatically extract those pages uh, and go ahead and add them to the desired, oh, let me go and select the folder, sorry. Let me go here and uh, hit that. And it'll go ahead and do that for me. And it's now opened and extracted all of those individually into that file format for me. Um, so again, a nice way of taking those and, and extracting them all out of the combined set into individual pages to allow that workflow. Um, let's talk a, a little bit about sets, and uh, I'm going to go ahead and open up a set folder here, and um, here we have uh, a multitude of drawings here, a lot of sets. Uh, we have some revisions as well as some original files. Um, so again, I have the ability to, to coordinate and view multiple files at the same time. Um, so I'm going to open up the sets tab. Um, and I'm going to uh, add uh, or create a new set. And I'm going to grab all of these files that are in here. Oh, just give me one second. I'm going to grab all of these sheets that are in here. Go ahead and just hit Control A and open those. And it's now effectively opened uh, or created a, a large preview of all of these sheets. So even though they're individual sheets, I now have them all opened and easily accessible uh, as an individual or as a combined drawing. So even though these are individual, I can now view them um, as if they were a combined drawing. Um, and you'll notice that I have here um, A201 Rev1, E101. So I've got, um, I've got some stacked drawings here uh, with revisions as well as the standard drawing. Um, so now what I can actually do is if I want to look at, say, the addendum or the revision process, uh, I, I can go ahead and modify that by going to Advance. And I'm going to say I would like to um, put in an addendum number here. And we'll say this is going to be rev number. And I'm going to go ahead and say I want to cross out any of the old ones and stack them on top of each other. And I'll go ahead and hit OK. Um, Maybe I'll choose that again, sorry. And I'll hit OK. And what that'll do is it will actually go ahead and as I draw go through these drawings. Um oh, has not. Let's try that one again. Okay. 
Let's go ahead and try that again. And there we go. We'll see that what we had previously here of A201 Rev1, you'll see that we've actually now got some underlying content here. I've got the ability to actually stack the old revision on top of the latest revision. If I were to click this back blue button, it will now enable me to jump back and see that the scored out revision is now there. Um, so if I were to scroll down, I know we've got some in the uh, in the uh, up here, we've got some additional ones. So yeah, here we are in E300. Um, I've got a, a couple of previous revisions here, Rev2, Rev1. You'll notice how they're scored out and they're stacked on top of each other. So a nice way of keeping a concurrent set um, and keeping all that information in one place. So we're going to talk a little bit about maintaining one current set and leveraging uh, studio projects. So earlier we showed you studio sessions, and now I want to show you studio projects. Um, so as many of you can probably attest, uh, one of the most critical aspects of managing a document set is the need for version control and the ability to maintain a single source of true documents for all the participants. Um, earlier we talked about studio sessions uh, for real-time collaboration and interview, uh, but there's another component to studio called projects. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen this, uh, project is kind of like a, a manager or a light document management system that provides users unlimited storage in the cloud and, uh, and the ability to maintain uh, control, again, over who can do what and who can see what. So I'll go ahead and open up Studio. This time I'll go down to my projects, open up the project session. And we'll notice here that I, um, I actually have the ability to view uh, all the information that might have come up under there. So I've maintained my project and file structure that I might have had on my network. Um, and, but here I've got all the information to come in here and look at individual files. Now these don't have to be PDFs. This is unlimited storage of any file format. So here I can review Word documents as well as PDFs. Um, so again, simulated the same uh, folder tree structure I might have on a network. And here I have the ability, like in something like SharePoint, where I can right-click, uh, check out those drawings uh, so that I myself can work on them. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to go to, let's open up the Sheets drawing. I'll open up A101 just to show you that we've also used hyperlinks here to create a, a navigable drawing set. So again, that same bookmarking and hyperlinking, should I want to jump to an exterior elevation, I can go ahead and... Uh, do that and it will allow me to go and jump to the applicable drawing and it will also open it up as a read only straight out of uh, straight out of the project session for me um, and then I can go ahead and when I'm done whatever the editing was I could go ahead and right click and check that copy back in again uh, enabling uh, other people to then do whatever kind of editing or workflow they need to um, Let's talk a little bit about quantity takeoff. So I'm going to go and open up my um, reflective ceiling plan. Um, so let's go ahead and grab that. That's uh, four, four, two. Let's go ahead and grab that one. I'll open it up. So here we have our reflective ceiling plan. And um, I'm actually going to switch to my estimation profile right now. So let's go grab that. You'll notice again, the interface changes. I've now got my estimation tools right here on the side. And um, let's say I want to perform a, a lighting count. I want to count how many lights there are in my, uh, in my drawing here. Um, I could use uh, a count tool to very quickly and very easily click and check on the ones that I have. Um, in this case, I actually want to leverage that, the power of that visual search and the enhancements we've made there. So I'm going to open up my, my search tab by uh, clicking uh, the little icon that looks like binoculars up here. And again, I could look for textural information, but in this case, I'm going to look for some visual. I'm going to want to click on visual. Um, I'm going to do get rectangle, and I'm just going to drag a rectangle around this part of the drawing here. And I have the ability to search by filters, by filter by color. Uh, in this case, I'll, I'll search this current page. I could also filter or search through an entire folder full of drawings, but this current page is fine for now. I'll go ahead and hit search. And uh, Bluebeam is going to run its way through and uh, do a visual search, and you'll see that all these results are now here. They're now posted and available for me to see. Um, I'll go ahead, and you might notice that it's found some, irrespective of any line work or detail that might be in there or interjecting or overlapping or even the fact that it hasn't completed the circle of some of these, 
you'll notice that it has actually gone ahead and found those for me. So now I can actually select all of those and uh, perform some kind of function to them. I could either highlight them just to indicate them on the drawing, but in this case I'm going to say apply a count uh, to everyone that's checked. So there you go, now uh, with one uh, sort of fell swoop it's gone ahead and checked every single lighting uh, fixture that I have in this drawing and um, it's also added them to my markup list down below now. So um, I have these individual ones that I did earlier and then I have 18 others over here. So uh, by visual search, really, really nice way of selecting all of those and then applying that count to uh, my markup list. Um, so as you can see, I've, I've tracked all of these in my markup list down below. Um, I could actually go one step further and let's go ahead and, and call them something that makes sense. Let's say that this is actually a uh, lighting fixture. So now it makes sense to me what they actually are. Um, and I've got here um, a lighting um, unit cost. I've got some descriptions in here. I've leveraged my custom columns. So let me go ahead and show you in the custom column, I created a, a custom column here called uh, lighting cost where I've pre-populated some different choices, type A through D, with varying numeric costs associated to them from $10 to $100. Um, so I can choose and select which ones I want. Let's say I want to add another custom column here, though, that's going to be a subtotal. So I'll go ahead and add subtotal. And D-A-L. Uh, go ahead and make that a formula column. And I'll leverage that uh, new expressions of the custom column here to say, I want this to be count, and I'll simply Type the first letter, so here count, uh, hit enter, and I'll say I want to times that by um, the lighting unit cost. So let's go ahead and choose the lighting unit cost. Uh, I'll say the format should be currency, two decimal places, and uh, I'll hit OK. So now you should notice that what this has actually done is created a subtotal column for me. So if I were to take these two lightings and say that these were type A's of $10, it would give me a $20 column. And if I were to come back in here and say these were type C's at $75 a piece, you'll notice that it's starting from now to do calculations for me and, and follow that up uh, right here in the markup list. So again, uh, if I had multiple elements and multiple objects here, I could count them all, assign the cost and the materials, and then very simply summarize that straight to Excel and push that information straight into something very, very easy to format and, uh, and further downstream workflow. So. Let's um, talk a little bit before we uh, jump out of this. Let's talk a little bit about um, tracking some field changes. We'll talk about the RFI process. So I'm going to go ahead and close some of these documents here. Um, I don't want to check changes. I don't need to check them back in right now. Um, so let's go ahead and we're going to go ahead and open up uh, my original drawing again. And I'm going to open up, I'm going to utilize some templates here. I have a template form that it was created. Uh, it's now in, uh, now in my uh, PDF document. So I'll go ahead and enter that and look at this one. And uh, we'll notice that this is actually a, a templated form here for an RFI. And let's say I want to fill this out. I'm just going to give it an RFI number, uh, 200. Take created. Um, it's going to be 3, 12, 13. Uh, date required, let's say this is uh, 314, very impatient with my RFIs, I want them back straight away. I could give this a subject that this is going to be a uh, curtain, curtain wall, uh, again spell check, this is great for us English folks here. Uh, I'll go ahead and say that this is actually going to be a structural problem and I could put subcontract information, drawing reference number, looks like it's A201. Just filling out this form is question, but um, I could say I've got a question. If I look at my other drawing over here, I've got a question about this curtain wall. I'd like some more information about that. So I could say uh, more uh, info required for curtain wall. And then I could say see uh, image below. Um, so the nice thing about this is I've added a second page to this. This is currently a two-page document. If I was to click on the second page, I can leverage something in Bluebeam called our snapshot tool. Um, so I'll go into edit. I'll grab my snapshot tool, which looks like a little uh, pair of binoculars. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, 
I see the first thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to put a markup on there. I'm going to change out it back to my AEC profile. I'm going to put a quick cloud over this area right here and, and maybe a quick uh, quick callout tool to very quickly say, uh, you know, uh, more info. And now I'll go ahead and use that snapshot tool to go ahead and take a quick picture of that and grab some more information around it for some context and just paste that right here on the document. I'm going to resize it because I don't need it the exact same size. And I'll just paste it on there. And then I can very happily um, unsplit this. But I can now very happily take this RFI and just email this straight off to whoever the recipient is going to be and have them sort of address what they need to. In this case, it's going to a, a structural engineer. Um, so he's going to receive this document and he's going to say, uh, please review or the attached model uh, below. And um, I'm now going to assume I am the structural engineer. And I'm going to grab my 3D editor tool and I'm going to create a location or a box here into which I am now going to place um, I'm now going to place a um, oh, with me. I'm now going to grab a complete IFC model. So this came out of Revit or, or uh, wherever it happened to be, uh, SolidWorks. And I'm now going to place that Revit model directly into the PDF as an IFC format. So now I've gone ahead and I'm still inside my PDF file. I'll zoom in here just so people can see. Uh, but I am still inside my PDF file, but I now have complete control and access over uh, the complete uh, integration into this uh, model here within the PDF file. Uh, I could even, one step further, come in here and cloud this area and uh, add another call. I can mark this up in 3D to say, um, here's the detail uh, of whatever it happens to be. Um, the nice thing is, this markup indicator, once I close it, I'm still free to navigate and zoom around this uh, 3D model, look at different parts. Um, I can even give this uh, a name. So if I were to look at my 3D model tree, um, I have the ability to give this markup view a name. This could be RFI 200. And uh, now it will have a name. So when I uh, navigate around other areas of this uh, 3D model, the minute I hover over this little indicator here to say there's a, there's a markup in here of RFI 200, it will automatically zoom and jump me to that location. So a phenomenal way of using and leveraging a technology that, that a lot of us are introducing now, the 3D elements, uh, and bringing that into the drawing itself. Um, incidentally, um, so I could go back to the top page of there and, and complete my RFI form, but while I'm in here, incidentally, um, we have actually brought through, even in the IFC format, I can click on individual subparts, and you'll see that those will now be listed. It's brought through the model, the parent-child information, right into this template here. So uh, some phenomenal workflow capabilities in 3D. Uh, in this case, I'm going to go back to the uh, top page. Uh, I could leverage maybe my uh, RFI tool set here, go ahead and sign this document, uh, put my signature in here, even put the date uh, that I've answered this, and uh, go ahead and uh, you know pretty much put the RFI number or the date in there. And then go ahead and save it, uh, close it, uh, email it to the recipient, and uh, check this up into a studio or a project location uh, to enable me to close out what I'm doing uh, in terms of that type of collaboration. So with that being said, I think we're running right at time. So what I'd like to do is um, turn this back over or open this up to uh, some questions, see if anything has come in here. And, um, and let's see if we have any questions here. Uh, looks like I got a whole bunch. So let's go ahead and try to uh, grab a couple of these. Um, some looks like Greg has asked, uh, when I create a 36 by 24 PDF in landscape format, will Bluebeam show portrait uh, and everybody has to rotate it in landscape? Um, that's, um, it will be generated or created from its original format. You, you can absolutely control that and be aware that there is two different ways to both view uh, or change the rotation of the view versus the document. Uh, I would leverage something like uh, the thumbnails tab uh, to right click and change the rotation of the thumbnail, uh, but you also have the ability to rotate the document itself. Um, and then as soon as you save it, everybody should have access to that. But if you've got um, 
additional questions, Greg, about that or need further clarifications, I'll certainly get in touch with you. Um, only hearing a seminar. Uh, please remain online. Um, with the Calc tool, it looks like Anthony's asked a question here. Uh, were there two light fixtures um, and 18 making a total of 20, or were they counted in the search? Uh, yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, I think what I did was I initially counted them individually. So when I did those first initial individual counts and then ran the visual search, it actually picked up the two that I did originally. So uh, there were only 18 and not 20. I had just performed that um, uh, independent of each other, which is why it showed up as that number. Um, but uh, hopefully that answers the question there for you, Anthony. Okay, so, so um, that being said, um, I, think, yeah. I think we're done at that point, and hand it I, over to you, sir. Okay. Um, well, James, I have a question myself because it looks like blue beam is used a lot in the construction industry. I mean, do you often? Uh, what other areas uh, would require blue beam besides in the construction industry? Um, that, that's a great question. I mean, uh, our primary focus has always been AEC, so architectural, engineering, and construction. Um, and so that, that really has for uh, almost a decade been our primary focus. But what we've seen with the introduction of searching tools uh, and uh, redaction and mock-up and tracking capabilities is really this has just come into the area of uh, additional additional workflow for additional verticals. So we're naturally being heavily utilized um, in non-AEC forms uh, right now, like um, the administration, medical, financial, tax, uh, legal. Uh, again, we're leveraging something that is now actually an ISO 32000 standard format. The PDF is now an ISO governed format. It is no longer solely owned by one company. Um, so the, the benefit of that to the end user is that anytime you use, work in, uh, develop a PDF file, it has universal accessibility for everybody. Um, uh, it looks like Greg, a uh, structural steel detailer. Uh, how can I do the take of, of steel members of different sizes? Um, that um, are you, it depends whether you're trying to do a length or a perimeter type count. Um, one of the other things that we can do is, is I, I can actually let me get back to you uh, on that with an additional answer there, uh, Greg, because it seems like uh, this could go into something. So I'll, I'll grab your information. I'll, I'll touch base with you after on that. Uh, Kevin, do you have any other additional questions? Okay, um, it looks like Damon uh, just put this one in. Uh, will OCR be available in this release? Uh, I'm not sure what OCR is, too, but could you go into detail about that? Absolutely, I can. Yeah, OCR has actually been available since version uh, 9. Um, and OCR actually stands for Optical Character Recognition. Um, so you can take something we typically... Uh, in the perfect world, we all receive PDF documents that are generated fresh out of AutoCAD or Revit, and they look beautiful. Um, but again, in the realistic world, we often go to flat files and we scan things in through devices, and um, oftentimes you cannot search uh, for certain words. So by leveraging OCR, you can basically take a document that was maybe an image, a PDF image, and turn what it, it'll try to perform optical character recognition to turn textual-based information into actually editable, searchable words in that case. Um, so definitely uh, something that's available. We have three versions of Bluebeam. We have standard, CAD, and extreme. A majority of what I've just shown you today is all in the standard version. Uh, OCR is something that is available in our extreme version only um, just because of the, uh, the advanced workflow that it enables. Um, uh, and extreme also comes with uh, um, uh, scripting, uh, redaction, OCR, and form field creation as well. So it really is a well-rounded product. Um, I got another quick question coming here. Uh, can we give me some quick info on the iPad application? Uh, how do you scroll down or, or limitations uh, to believe really a full version? Uh, yeah, the iPad version uh, is available on the on the Apple iStore. Um, a, a little watered down version of what we've been showing you today, but a lot of the same functionality is there in terms of the ease of comments, the tool chest, and the markup list. Um, but uh, 
how do you scroll down uh, the limitations relative to the CAD uh, the full desktop version? Um, I would say that the main limitations are really that um, you're not going to want to use the iPad for something like takeoff and estimation, so that isn't in there um, just because of the nature of what the iPad is, the intrinsic of the device itself. Um, the ability to add custom columns on in the iPad version right now. So the intent really is that the iPad is going to be a field-based document use. So you would generate or set the PDF file, PDF file up the way you want with the custom columns in there that you need. And then people would go off out in the field and do their site walks, their punch walks, their commenting on site. Um, and uh, really, majority of the other format or majority of the other information is still there in the iPad version. So you have statuses that are in there. You have the ability to review the markup list. And Studio Interact, obviously, straight to, straight to the iPad version as well. There is additional information on bluebeam.com um, or the iStore that will actually list the, uh, the complete features of the iPad version. Um, but I'll try to get something additional to you uh, who asked that question. Okay, and um, I think uh, Damon brings uh, up. Let me ask. Sorry, we're asking. Right. Oh, yeah. sorry. No, go ahead. Sorry, I think we're looking at the same question too. I think right? I was going to address Damon's question. He brought yeah, up yeah. a great <laughs> question here about uh, he, he has the CAD version, uh, and it seems like you need to upgrade to Extreme. Is this available? Absolutely. Um, we do not hold uh, any values on, on upgrade. We we allow everybody to upgrade from whatever version they had. You could be on standard version nine and want Extreme version eleven. It's one upgrade price. It's as simple as that. So, um, yep, doesn't matter what prior version you were running, um, older than uh, all the way back to two, three, four, or five, uh, or which which version, whether it was a CAD standard or Extreme, you can actually upgrade um, to any capacity you need to very quickly, very efficiently. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, because um, that's because I know we're talking about standard here, and uh, what are the major selling points for extreme? Because you know there's standard and there's extreme. I mean, what are the major differences that separate the two, and what are the reasons, possible reasons, why people might want to upgrade to extreme instead of standard? So that's um, no, of great, great question. Yeah, no, standard gives you a lot of the the core cool functionality and workflow. CAD, the CAD edition will also bring in for those of you that are, and I like to. Put this as so those of you that are producers of PDF files out of native applications such as Revit, AutoCAD, SolidWorks, Navisworks, we have a plug-in technology into all of those that is available in the CAD edition. So with the CAD edition, you get all the standard functionality plus direct plug-in integration uh, into those uh, CAD-related products. What Extreme gives you over all of those is then, as we said, it gives you the OCR capability to perform that optical character recognition. It gives you form field creation. So I have the ability to uh, look at forms here and create forms. So I could insert a text box very quickly, very easily. Uh, I could insert drop downs or check boxes very quickly, very easily, um, and actually have data come out of that very quickly and very easily. Um, it also gives you JavaScripting and redaction for the legal world. So we see Extreme uh, being used by my more of the heavy hitters, by more advanced document users uh, in, say, administrative roles that need form field integration or need the ability to perform that optical character recognition to take paper image-based documents into something more editable. And then we also see a, a heavy leverage into the uh, tax um, fiscal worlds where redaction is needed, where you need to go through and permanently eradicate uh, information out of a PDF document. Um, with PDFs becoming a lot more of a of dynamic format now, it's not just a simple static format it used to be. The idea of document security and, and redaction is huge. You might want to pull out all of your vendor information, license or billing information out of a PDF document before you send it downstream to your owner, operator, sub, vendor, third party, whoever it might be. So uh, that is sometimes very useful. And, and PDF security is something to take very seriously. Cool. I think uh, that, that about sums up the Q&A session. Uh, James, um, I guess uh, we're pretty much ready to hand it over back to me. That sounds great. Let me, uh, can you, are you going to steal that from me or shall I make you the presenter? I will probably make myself the presenter. I think. You have all the power. Look at you. <laughs> cool. All right. Here we go. Cool. Uh, let's see. Awesome. So let me know if you guys can see the slides here. Hello? Hello? Um, not yet. Uh, 
There we go. How about now? There you go. Awesome. So uh, on behalf of the Novich team, I want to thank James Chambers and Allison for joining us today. Uh, thank you, attendees, for joining us and, uh, you know, just paying attention and just checking out, learning a little bit more about Bluebeam Review uh, 11. And we learned a little bit more. Even though today was about standard, we're going to learn a little bit more about extreme as well. I'll do ca cabin for a second. So oh, the audio? Okay. Well, thanks, guys, uh, for joining us today. Um, so if you want to learn more about Bluebeam Review 11, um, head on over to www.bluebeam.com. James, uh, per James' recommendation, uh, there's a lot of information. There's an online community. There's a newsletter, uh, events that you can uh, sign up for. And also there's the Bluebeam University where you can get help from the start uh, with uh, videos and PDF tutorials as well. In addition, um, no, today's uh, Novage webinar series is brought to you by, in part by Novage. Uh, um, as one of the largest online design software stores, we offer a huge assortment of software solutions that cater to virtually every designer's need. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing a copy of Bluebeam 11, Review 11, it is available worldwide from us at NoVeg as a digital delivery with zero sales tax. So if you are interested, give us a call and feel free to contact our sales representative, Bob Thayer, at bob at NoVeg.com. Aurora? Yes, thank you, Kevin. That was a great webinar. Thank you, James and Allison, for making it happen. So, um, everybody, I just wanted to remind you one more time, <clears throat> excuse me, that you can find us on Facebook. Come and wish us a happy um, 10th anniversary and join us in San Francisco next week if you're a local. And then also take a look at all the new interviews on our blog every Tuesday and Friday morning. All right, uh, in our next upcoming webinar, we will be uh, co-hosting with Chris Stringer from Arlantis. Uh, if you want to get to know Arlantis Studio 4.1, this webinar will have Objects Online General Manager Chris Stringer on hand to cover the different types of shaders you'll need to create impressive renders and animations in Arlantis Studio 4.1. So if you want more details, visit our webinar page at noveg.com forward slash webinar forward slash 69. And if you have any questions, comments, concerns, please email me at kevin at kevinovidge.com. Uh, if you miss something, if you want to rewatch re a specific part uh, that James Chambers was talking about for Bluebeams, uh, feel free to head on over to vimeo.com forward slash noveg and also youtube.com forward slash noveg. There, um, at the end of today, we'll be uploading um, today's webinar, and you'll be able to find it by tomorrow. Uh, so if you have any questions, comments, concerns, go ahead, check it out there. Like us and subscribe if you want more content like this. All right, and on behalf of the Novage team, uh, on behalf of James, uh, thank you for joining us today, and uh, we hope to see you guys on Facebook, Google+, and also follow us at Novage Store on Twitter. Uh, James, do you have any uh, parting comments or last words before we shut this down? I uh, don't. Just thank you, everybody. Thank you, Novage, and thank you, everybody who attended. Uh, some great questions. and. Uh, Look forward to uh, continue your relationship and uh, anything we can answer and address in the future. Cool. All right. All right. Oh, no PDFing. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. All right.